chapter number 4. And uh, I'm going to just begin with one passage of Scripture. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse number 32 And the Bible says in Ephesians 4.32, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. I want you to answer a question this evening as we start into this message. Which sin in your life did Jesus not forgive? Or what sins, plural, in your life did Jesus not forgive? And if you come up with the answer, which is the biblical answer, that there is none, then that's exactly how many sins you ought to hold on to for others. It says... Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing passage of Scripture. As I've said already, this doesn't deal just with marriage, but it, it goes to preserving anybody's relationships. So whether you're here and you're single, it, it's applicable to you for a couple of reasons. Number one, you have friendships now, and you possibly are going to be married later. And, of course, if you're married now, then by all means, uh, this is applicable because everybody wants to have their marriage preserved. Divorce is probably the biggest issue of the day. Sadly, it's even the biggest issue amongst Christians. It, it always was the case that there was divorce. But you know, for many, many years, the Christian community lagged way behind the world, and now we're exactly where the world is. Do you know that one out of every two Christian, I mean, marriages of Christians ends in divorce? One out of every two. You understand why we want to invest in a marriage retreat? Um... Listen, when, <laughs> lest anybody think for a minute that somehow Elmwood's making anything on this marriage retreat, let me assure you that this retreat's costing twice as much as what you're paying. Okay? And that's, that's okay. That, that is absolutely okay. Because we want relationships we want marriage relationships to be strong. I don't think there's any honor in finding out that in our church somebody got a divorce. It may happen, and maybe it has happened. I don't know. But, but it shouldn't happen. It shouldn't take place. Because there's, there's things in the Bible, very simple things in the Bible, that if we implement these things, they're going to preserve every relationship that we have. And, and not, not the least of which, it also secures and makes strong our relationship with the Lord. So, as we look in Ephesians chapter number 4, ask yourself this question. Is my marriage worth the effort to preserve? Is my friendship worth the effort to preserve. Because I'll say quickly at the onset of this message, onset of this message, that listen, if some of this was so easy, everybody'd be doing it and I wouldn't have any need of preaching it. But the truth of the matter is, is that these are these things are difficult and they're choices and they're difficult choices sometimes because we're dealing with our old sinful flesh. And so we got a battle going on. You're a Christian, you know that. Satan's fighting you every single moment of every single day. And, and so we're fighting the world, the flesh, the devil, 
and, uh, and all the various different lusts. Dr. Coomer identified 82 different lusts in the Bible. Sometimes when we think of the word lust, we're thinking of some, something sexual. It's not the case. Most of the lusts have nothing to do sexually. But we battle our lusts. And our lusts carry us away into sin. But why are so many married couples, when you think about it, why are so many married couples miserable when it didn't start out that way? It started out possibly at an altar someplace and and they looked lovingly into one another's eyes and said, I do, and recited vows and, and determined on that day those vows would never be broken. And then somewhere down the line, something happened. You know, there was, a, there was a kind of a cliche that was put forth many moons ago. Familiarity breeds contempt. It can happen. It can happen in marriages just as it happens in, in other associations. Uh, sometimes people get so used to one another that they take advantage of that. And that, that shouldn't be. So, to a large extent, however, the newness of marriage wears off. And I, I don't mean that in a real negative way. It's just, the, you know, as, as life goes on, there's challenges within marriage. And uh, we've heard it mentioned already this evening in the promo video and from this pulpit. There's challenges. And, and anybody who says otherwise is really living in a fantasy world. People sometimes have irritating habits. I know that doesn't exist here, but I mean, I'm, I'm preaching to other people. Little idiosyncrasies that, that, that we as spouses put up with. And that's good. Putting up with is actually a good phrase. We, we are long-suffering. And, and to not be that way means that we are going to become bitter. It means we're going to become angry. It means that we're going to become argumentative. It means there's going to be maliciousness in our behavior. It means there's going to be, as I preached this morning, a resentfulness that exists, a hatred that exists. Uh, and as our text talks about, an unforgiving spirit. So responses like those grieve the Holy Spirit of God. If I can get one thing across in this message tonight, it's simply this, that if we don't follow what the Lord has laid out for us for our relationships and concerning our behavior, then we're really only hurting ourselves. We, we indeed may be hurting some others, but in large measure, we are actually just hurting ourselves because we're grieving the Holy Spirit of God, and one day we're going to stand before God. You know, any Christian that has a fear of the Lord is going to want to look at these things, and they're going to say, and the Holy Spirit of God may be that great reminder that, wow, he's preaching to me. Well, I'm not preaching to anybody. I'm preaching to me. I'm also preaching to you. But the Holy Spirit of God knows how to, how to preach it better than Gary Randall knows how to preach it. And if there's any fear of the Lord, and what is the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord is the knowledge of knowing that I have to stand before God one day and give an account of myself. And you know, that is an awesome thing. You know, I, 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 I have to question the honesty of a Christian who says, boy, I'm really looking forward to standing before Jesus. I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus because I know that Jesus loves me. But I also know that he's a fair judge. I also know that at the judgment seat of Christ, Christians are going to get exactly what they deserve, not what they hope to get what they actually deserve. 
And boy, when you think about that, beloved, that is an awesome thing to stand before the Lord, isn't it? It's not a sin judgment. Heaven is settled at the cross of Calvary. But boy, oh boy, there is a judgment seat of Christ. So when the Holy Spirit of God sees the behavior of some that is not what the Bible ought to say, uh, we see it in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 and 31. It says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice or the sense of getting even, or you just wait, or I, I you know, I'm going to do this, or I, you know, threats, threats. That's called malice in the Bible. Our relationships, no matter what they are, but particularly tonight in the, in the context of marriage, our relationship with our spouse has to be one of charity. Charity in 1 Corinthians 13 is love that demonstrates itself. It is the love of Jesus. It is agape. It is the love that gives itself in sacrifice. You know, how important is the church? Well, the church is so important that Ephesians 5.25 says that Christ gave himself for the church. He loved the church and gave himself for it. So to have a Christ-like love means that it's a sacrificial love. It, it means that it's a sacrifice, by the way, on both parts. Sacrifice of the husband to the wife, a, a sacrifice of the wife to the husband. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 8, the Bible tells us, and above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Does that, does that mean that we compromise? I mean, pastor, it sounds like compromise that if sin took place, that, that, we just, that we just compromise that. No, it's talking about that love is so, charity, agape love is so powerful that we don't take up every single little infraction that comes our way. That we can pray about people and we can pray about our relationships and we can pray about things that maybe aren't right, and we don't have to get into World War III over it. So, it, it, it overlooks some things. It, it doesn't take notice of every offense that comes along. It always is striving for peace. So you let things pass. You bear them up. You forgive them in your own heart and you bring them before God. And what this does when we give it over to God is it neutralizes any effort by the devil to try to create in us any kind of hard feeling. Listen, everybody who knows Gary Randall knows that I didn't come from this kind of way. I, I have, in my life, learned the very, very hard lessons of temper, impatience. I have, late in life, come to realize that it's just not worth it to argue about things. It's just not worth it. It's better to strive for peace, and sometimes that means you just have to give some things over to the Lord and say, God, you take care of it. And if you're to preserve your relationship, then that relationship needs to have this kind of thing happen in order for it to stay warm. And it might very well be that it's going to take a lot of work. 
So we see three things in Ephesians 4. The first thing we see in verse 32. And be ye kind one to another. Kind. Kind means pleasant. Kind means, uh, you know, I, I have a smile on my face as opposed to some kind of sharp or bitter word or, or some kind of harsh response. Um, kind, kind is good-natured. Kind is inclined to do good for others even if good has not been done to me. And the Bible speaks to these kind of things. If you only love those that love you, how are you any different than lost people? You sure aren't like Christ. If you only do good for those that do good to you, then how are you any different than the lost world out here? No. As a matter of fact, when we do good to those who actually don't do good to us. Brother Steve, can I share that example you shared with me tonight? Just briefly. So Brother Steve, he shared with me, and I won't go into great detail, but he did some work for a guy on his house. His house needed to desperately need some work done. And this individual had had some bad blood going on in his family. Can I just leave it like that? Anyway, he was taken advantage of in his family for many thousands of dollars, and here he was. He, he virtually didn't have any money. His house was in desperate need of repair. Brother Steve came alongside of him and repaired his house. He just did that because he was just trying to reach out in kindness and love to this guy. What was the result? Well, he got a great monetary payment. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Here's what he did get. Was it a phone call? A text message. This man asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come in his heart and save him. And I, I know the result, I know, I know what was happening is that while Steve was working, Steve was witnessing. Steve was sharing Christ. And because of kindness and because of love, and kindness and love really can accomplish some things, can't it? Well, this guy saw Christ in Steve. And he wanted the Christ that Steve was talking about. Am I pretty accurate, Steve? <laughs> I guess the point of the illustration, and I like real life illustrations. He had no idea what I was preaching on tonight. But the truth of the matter is, is that we are, when we're kind and when we, we do good to others and we don't expect anything in return and we're doing it because we're, we're serving the Lord and because this is what God wants me to do, then, then honestly God's going to bring forth the results that only God can bring forth. And I have to say tonight that in no uncertain terms, kindness... The act of kindness is expected behavior for the Christian. We ought to be kind. Amen? Especially in marriage. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 33 and 34, the Apostle Paul writes, he says, But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, uh, how he may please his wife. There is... There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman care for the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world how she may please her husband. So it's about pleasing the wife and it's about pleasing the husband. And too often, too often in the day in which we live we have migrated over to it's all about pleasing me. 
Well, I'm sorry, it's not in the scriptures. It's not there. But that is a real cause for a lot of problems. So we're kind. Look for ways to do good. Encourage. Assist. Help. Do what you can to help. Um, it, it is so important that people say kind words to one another. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, it, it, it talks about uh, our speaking. It says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm chapter 5. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So we need to, we need to watch how we speak. Words are weapons. But words can also be great, great gifts of edification. There's an old saying that says the road to the heart is the ear. You know, we, we've heard maybe it said the road to a man's heart is through his stomach. I don't know if that's true or not. Although, if you have any desire to try that, my office is upstairs. <laughs> so, we have like 10,000 plus minutes every week of our life. The average couple, do you realize, spends only about 17 minutes a week in close communication. That's, that's pretty alarming, isn't it? Out of all those minutes. Peter told husbands that they, in First Peter chapter 3, verse 7, dwell with them, their wives, according to knowledge. What do you know about your wife? And it, it just simply is an admonition, isn't it? That if you don't have the knowledge you should have, then, then get to know your wife. Get to know your wife. This is something that is vitally important. It isn't going to happen by accident. It's going to happen by intentional listening, intentional um, hearing what someone has to say. And that's what James talks about, that we be, that we be uh, slow to wrath and that we be swift to hear, you know, sort of slow to speak and, 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 and swift to hear and slow to wrath. We ought, to, we ought to remember what's being said. And we ought to watch how we say things. Don't forget, don't forget that how you say something is just as important or maybe even more important than what it is that you're trying to say. So be a good listener. To be kind means you need to know and, and in order to know, we have to listen. And, uh, and so... We got to be a good listener. We need to sometimes zip it. And and when it is that we speak, let's speak truthfully. Let's use the truth, not like a weapon, but use the truth in love. To be courteous to one another. Um, I think everybody that has a relationship, whether it's a friend or a spouse, there's, there's, they deserve courteous uh, behavior. Don't exaggerate. You know, um, in, in counseling when someone says, well, every time that... No, that word is an exaggeration. Because nothing is every time. It just doesn't happen that way. We exaggerate to support our argument for something. And we've all done it. You always... No, nobody always does anything. Even if it's bad. They don't always be bad. You never... 
Really, are you sure about that? As one man said in a counseling session, you know, when my wife and I get into a fight, she gets very historical. Maybe that's where the, you never, because she can remember everything back to the very beginning. I can't remember what I had for breakfast. Exaggeration is lying. It's lying. When I exaggerate something, I'm, I'm telling a lie. Exag exaggerated threats are also common because words spoken sometimes cut very, very deeply. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 25, the Bible says, Wherefore put away putting away, lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So we're to put it away. The other thing, too, that the Bible speaks of in Ephesians chapter 2, and just turn back a couple pages, if you would, to verse 26. Resolve arguments the same day. Ephesians chapter 2, I'm sorry, what did I tell you? Oh, I lost my verse. 426, yeah, you're correct. Thank you. <coughs> Be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Anger is something that's going to happen, but we don't have to sin. And we can surely resolve things. And God says, listen, don't, don't, let, don't, don't let it linger on because the next day it's not going to be better. It's not going to be better. So resolve arguments uh, the same day. Secondly, be tender-hearted, the Bible says in Ephesians 4.32, and be ye tender-hearted. So that's a term that, that doesn't get used very often, but it describes a person who is understanding and who is merciful. And I think that's the best way that I can, I can uh, identify that. I'm glad that God is not hard-hearted when it comes to Gary Randall. Aren't you glad that God's not hard-hearted? In Lamentations 3 and verse 22 and 23, it says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. We're instructed to be compassionate, which is being tender-hearted. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love his brethren. Be pitiful, which means to be considerate, and be courteous. So we, we need to put tender-heartedness in there. And then <clears throat> the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. So we need to submit ourselves one to another. That's, that's, part, of, that's part of the whole equation of building a strong, strong relationship, preserving my marriage. You see, Marriage isn't a dictator-doormat relationship. It isn't, uh, well, the man is better than the woman. That's not true. It's just not a fact. Now, there is a line of authority that God puts in place. But you know that authority is all under the great authority of God Almighty. So are wives to submit to their husbands? Of course. In every area except for sin. No one is ever required to submit to sin. But, but husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So, and verse 21 of Ephesians chapter 5, notice, notice what it says. It says, submitting yourselves again, one to another. 
in the fear of the Lord. So it, it's a it's a mutual uh, a mutual relationship, and uh, and it invokes tender heartedness. Um, to be tender hearted, not hard hearted, to be compassionate instead of being cruel. And thirdly, verse 32 says forgiving one another. This is the big one, isn't it? All of them are important, but this last one is probably where the greatest challenges exist. To grant forgiveness. To grant forgiveness even if forgiveness isn't requested. That we just forgive. Why? Because if we don't forgive, then what's going to happen is we're going to get bitter. And when we get bitter, we're going to defile everything around us. It's amazing. It's amazing when you know, uh, you know, somebody who's been bitter, usually, I mean, you look at their kids and their kids are hard hearted. Why? Because their hearts have been affected by a loved one's bitterness. Forgiveness is a choice, just like love is a choice. You don't fall in love. You choose to love. You choose to love because what is transpiring in your life. You make the choice to love. And you make the choice to forgive. You make the choice to overlook a mistake. You make the choice to overlook a hurt or some kind of injury. You make the choice. You don't demand some kind of penalty to be paid. You make the choice to forgive. Because Christ forgave you. If marriage is to be preserved, let me back up. If marriage is to even survive, there has to be generous dispensing of forgiveness. We're sinners. We're sinners. We still have a sin nature. Pressures of life can get to every single one of us and the next thing you know, something comes out of our mouth that shouldn't have come out of our mouth. But you know something, the person that is understanding, who's kind and tender-hearted, who is also forgiving, is going to understand and isn't going to ratchet that thing up into World War III. Because soft answers turn away wrath. And grievous words stir up anger. So forgiveness must be there. And if forgiveness is not there, then a wall of bitterness is going to be in its place. Forgiveness is the right thing to do, beloved. Are you listening to me? We need to be kind, we need to be tender-hearted, but boy, we need to be forgiving. In Colossians 3 and verse 12 and following, it says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. We need to do this. We need to have this. All of us have a past. Some of our pasts are worse than others. We sometimes carry baggage around. We shouldn't because when we came to Christ, He eliminated the baggage. We don't have to pick it up. We don't have to carry around. We don't have to live in the past. We choose to live in the past. We don't have to live there. We don't have to continue to walk in the bad old days. When something goes wrong, many times, many times, people don't take responsibility. Why? Because we all battle this big thing called pride. Pride is a root sin. What I mean by that is pride 
is the root of so many other sins in people's lives. It's oftentimes very difficult for some reason, for some people, to ever say, I'm sorry. To ever admit that they could possibly have been wrong. To ever acknowledge that maybe, possibly, they could have been part of or the whole of the problem. But you know, be that as it may, somebody has to be willing to forgive. Whether it's asked for. By the way, <laughs> by the way, if, if it has to be asked for before it can be given, then how are we any different than the lost world? See, we are trying to, our lives are, uh, are a constant endeavor to be conformed to the image of Christ, not the image of the next best worldly fleshly thing. You know, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. <laughs> I mean, while we were yet, while we were cussing his name, while we were pretending to be so self righteously moral, which is just as wicked, while we were, had nothing to do with him, he died for us. He extended forgiveness to us. So when you're wrong, be mature enough to own up to it. I mean, put away pride. Learn to say I'm sorry when it's necessary to say I'm sorry. And then the other side of the coin is, uh, that 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 must be looked at is that is that forgiveness and this could be a choke point don't let it be but the attitude of of one bitter woman uh, to her counselor is it'll be a cold day in hell before I ever forgive him well you know something. The other side of forgiveness is unforgiveness. And boy, when someone says, I don't care, I don't care how much he or she apologizes, I don't care what he or she does, I'm done, I'm finished, I'm over with, I'm, it's finished, it's, I'm done, and it'll be a cold day in hell before I ever forgive. That person is finished. If that person is even a Christian, they're in serious trouble with God. That should never be the case. Because Christ has forgiven us. And that's, by the way, there it is in black and white in, in the Bible. We are to forgive one another even as Christ, even as we have been forgiven. Even, even as God has forgiven us for Christ's sake, we need to forgive others. And when you, forgive, what, when you forgive somebody, what does that mean? What Really, what does that mean? Does it mean amnesia? Does it mean that you actually forget what happened? No. Just like you can't forget your past, well, you can't forgive sometimes the things that happen in our relationships, but we need to forgive. Because we just can't carry around unforgiveness. It'll destroy us. Dr. J. Adams said, in forgiveness you're promising and choosing not to use it against the person in the future. In other words, nobody in a fight is going to get historical. Well, you know, three years ago you... Well, you know, all that says is that three years ago I didn't forgive you and I'm still not forgiving you. Secondly, you're promising and choosing not to talk about it to others. 
We don't get going on the Baptist telephone ministry. We don't get going on the best friend telephone ministry. Lastly, Dr. Adams said, you're promising and choosing not to dwell on it. Satan can bring it up and you can cast it away. Satan can bring it up and you can cast it away. Forgiveness pays off. God has a plan for preserving every relationship, including marriage. Be kind, be tenderhearted, be forgiving. If we do that, if we do those three things, pretty simple, not profound, not easy, takes effort. It takes defeating pride in my life, and it takes getting over myself. But if we're kind and tenderhearted and forgiving, every single relationship in my life will be preserved. It'll be preserved. If I don't, then hold on, because all your relationships are in trouble. Let's bow our heads tonight. Father in heaven, <clears throat> to me this message is very, very, very powerful. Your word is so absolutely searching, powerful. This two-edged